Let's continue our discussion about evolution and sex with a look at society. Sexual selection is that selection effected on one sex by the other. And the chooser can either be choosing um, based on appearance or behavior. Size is often a factor. And the whole key here is which will make the best mate. The more attractive individual is assumed to be a better potential mate. And sometimes that might not even be logically the case, but what really matters is how many matings uh, succeed and then which of those offspring produced get to reproduce themselves. So even traits that might make mates males, let's say, more vulnerable to predators, like huge, long, fancy tails that predators could easily grab. If that makes them more attractive to females, those things will be chosen, and those individuals will be more fit. Here's a beautiful local example of sexual selection. In the painted bunting, small birds that you might be lucky to see in a bush around your house or at a bird feeder, the most spectacular one is the male with a variety of beautiful colors. And at our feeder, I was seeing a lot of these little green birds. I thought they were a different species. Then I learned they were female painted buntings, cryptically colored, much, easy, much more easily hidden. And they are the choosy ones in this species. Some of the most Amazing examples of sexual selection are seen in the Birds of Paradise. And there's a video or two you can look at to see some examples. On the lower left here is a flower called the Bird of Paradise. But here are just two of the many bizarre, amazing varieties that the males that not only look spectacular, but often have very cool dances or displays for the females. So why have these huge, fancy decorations? It might be that only males that are healthy enough can carry them off, that have the ability to survive even with these appendages. Basically, if the fitness gains outweigh those costs, the male will be a winner. This doesn't only apply to birds and their plumage, but in fact parasites also play a role. And a very important paper by William Hamilton and Marlene Zook took a look at that. In experiments where biologists artificially lengthen or shorten the display item, in this case the length of the tail, you can see that Bigger is better. The longest tail has the greatest number of matings and fitness. And here's how parasites may be involved in this prairie chicken. The female likes the handsome, full-feathered, puffed-up male. He looks like a high-quality mate. A scrawny, unhealthy-looking bird is rejected. A bird in the middle of ambiguous merit may be accepted if nobody better is around, but if there's a fat, fluffy one, he'll be rejected also. So the reason for this is that parasites often make an individual uh, lower energy, less healthy, less glossy, less fat. So there may be a visible indication of levels of parasites, or sometimes even auditory. In crickets, the males stridulate. They make clicks rubbing the ends of their wings over these little ridged plates. The louder, lower, and longer the chirp, the more attractive it is to females. However, Chirping cricket is much more 
ob is obvious to predators, the longer and louder it is, the more easy the predator more easily the predator can find that cricket. But it turns out when people have caught these crickets and examined them, the males that can make the longer, lower sounds have fewer parasites. So it's not only visual but auditory. The root of social behavior is sex. Think about it. Mates are usually not related to one another, but they cooperate to make their offspring. Normally, without sex, unrelated individuals have little or less in common, and conflict is more the usual thing. And in many species, behavior toward relatives is modified by the extent of relatedness. The more related, the more cooperation. In groups of organisms, birds in flocks are a good example. Dominance hierarchies develop. Sometimes this is called pecking orders in a group of chickens. And the birds that are the most highest ranking are in the center. They are the most important and most protected against predators by pecking their way into the safe spot. Here's a soaring flock of birds. I thought it was great you all came to hear Dr. Bertozzi's lecture about swarming behavior and how fascinating that was to find that just by adjusting the parameters you could have movement models describing real things. One kind of social interaction that's very interesting to me is territorial defense. When organisms have a good supply of resources, they may defend these against intruders, protecting them for themselves and their mates. Hummingbirds, for example, around a good plant, a good hibiscus bush full of nectar, may defend these against other interloping hummingbirds. This may actually promote outcrossing in the plants. Or chipmunks, little squirrels on the forest floor with a supply of seeds or acorns exhibit territorial behavior. When food is more spread out, the territories are larger. And when food isn't abundant, there's little or no territoriality. So this is because energy coming from food is important for reproduction. Some organisms live in social groups where you have unrelated individuals all living together in the same place. An example of this is seen in the pinyon jays in the southwestern U.S. A large flock of them can occupy a space as big as several hectares, and this group condenses to a smaller uh, area covered when they're foraging. It's very cute that they form pair bonds, males and females, with a ritual where the male feeds seeds to the beloved just like a parent feeding a chick. I guess that's to show he'll be a good provider to their babies. But with this group of unrelated individuals, some individuals serve as sentries perching high at the edge of the flock, warning of predators, and just like in a number of songbirds, if they see a threatening owl or whatever, they mob the owl, making lots of noise to draw attention to the predator. Sometimes these groups may have communal nesting and share the feeding of their chicks. But in species where helpers at the nest have been observed, it turns out those are usually the older siblings of the babies being fed. Here's a pinyon jay sitting with on a pinyon pine cone and shown in the lower right digging out those delicious seeds, pine nuts. You may know these from Italian cooking. In these beautiful bee eaters, the extent of cooperation is directly related to the amount of relatedness. So the probability of helping on the y-axis here increases the more related the birds are. 
we can talk about inclusive fitness of the gene and actually of individuals so that their fitness isn't only their own, but the fitness of all other individuals related to them. And this can lead, be an explanation of kin selection. If we say that the likelihood of two individuals sharing the same gene is P, that's the extent of relatedness or the extent of identity by descent, you can figure out this identity by descent probability of relatedness with yourself and all of your different relatives. There's only one person you're related to 100%, and that's yourself. Your parents, you share half their genes, each one, and your offspring also. So those are the two groups of most closely related people to you. Oh, also your siblings, 50%. If someone shares only one of your parents, then that's half of 50%, 25%. the same as you are related to a grandparent or a grandchild, or your uncles and aunts, or your nephews and nieces. A first cousin is half of that, 0.125 or 12.5%. So as they say, you can pick your friends, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your relatives. So this chart shows all of these relationships and the percentages of relatedness. So what is the benefit of helping someone else? If they're related to you, the cost can be very worth the benefit because you are having benefiting your own genes by helping them. So on the left, it shows the cost-benefit ratio for altruistic behavior. If it's greater than this line, it's very easy to help. If it's less, not so much. This graph on the right relates to something we'll talk about in the next slide, the coefficient of relationship on the y-axis again, <clears throat> and the cost-benefit ratio for selfish behavior on the bottom. Trading off. It's an illustration of the parent-offspring conflict. <clears throat> because parents should invest equally in all their children. They're equally related to each one, 50%. But offspring see it differently. They're related to their sibs 50%, but they're related to themselves 100%. So traits that favor selfishness are selected for, as long as the cost is less than twice the benefit. And we can define inclusive fitness of the gene. If W equals fitness, this is the um, symbol often used for fitness, Inclusive fitness is the fitness of an individual plus the sum of relatedness of that individual to the others times the fitness of the other individuals. An explanation for the altruistic behavior seen in many animals can be explained by kin selection or inclusive fitness of the gene. In meerkats, they live together in underground burrows, big nests, and some will always be alert, looking around to see what's happening, and if they see something to warn the others about, they'll yip or make a loud noise, making themselves more vulnerable to the predators. Ground squirrels, marmots, other animals that live in nests in the ground, prairie dogs, also make these alarm calls, but the cost of calling is that individual's more likely to get eaten. It turns out when people have studied these, carefully marking animals and following them, the callers are usually females, and the longer a female has been on the nest, the more likely she is to call. This is because females 
stay in the nest, whereas males, when they grow up, disperse and live other places. So the longer the female's in her colony, the more relatives she has. So the benefit of this risky behavior is, as long as their genes survive in their others, in the, the relatives, their genes will be selected and carry on, so the behavior also will be selected. Let's talk a little more about helpers at the nest, which are grown birds that hang around nesting adults. It turns out they're related to the parents and their siblings by 50%, so it benefits their own fitness, their own genes to help their parents raise their brothers and sisters. This is more commonly seen in tropical places than in temperate zones, in the temperate zone, because in those places there's pretty high adult survival and competition for good places to live. There are density-dependent limits to being territorial. And if older siblings stick with their families, the productivity of the family can exceed that of single pairs of birds by means of inclusive fitness. And it will also benefit some of those older siblings eventually when the parents don't reproduce anymore, die or whatever, and hand over their territory to the helpers. Lastly, there's a phenomenon called reciprocal altruism that has been proposed for human behavior that where altruistic things happen toward people to whom the doer is not related. And reciprocal altruism more often happens between unrelated individuals, those that are involved in a long association, maybe neighbors or whatever, professors and students, teachers and their students, where an unselfish act may result in future reciprocation. 